Yeah, Fred, F-R-A-D, Nelson, N-E-L-S-O-N. And you want to remind Fred about the eye line to keep, sure. keep looking to your... Yeah, and you'll just keep looking at me through off yeah. the interview. Okay. okay. So, Fred, uh, how old were you during the 1964 flood? I should be about 36. Okay. And where did you work? I worked at the post office here in, locally in Eureka. Okay. And ha um, what happened during the 1964, and how did it kind of affect you and your job? Well, at that time, I was the assistant superintendent of mails. And, um, of course, the roads were deteriorating. We were having problems moving in the mail. And a few days, I don't remember the dates, but a number of days before Christmas, uh, everything shut down as far as transportation was concerned, except some air. And uh, one of my bosses decided that uh, he would check out, he made a number of, of telephone calls and figured that uh, possibly we could send somebody up to the airport to try and hitchhike the mail in and out of, of uh, the area. We had no contracts with anyone except our regular airline flights in here, which were passenger planes also. So it was decided to uh, send me up to uh, take charge of the airport as far as mail was concerned. So I was dispatched up there and I spent the next about 11 days <clears throat> going back and forth. I didn't stay up there 24 hours a day, but I was up there from dawn till dark for the next 11 days. Um, one of the things that, that helped us as far as post office was concerned, we had a brand new postmaster who was being um, trained by one of our postal service officers from Santa Rosa, and he happened to be up here and he got stuck behind the flood. So consequently, uh, he took charge. His name was Clay Fisher, a real sharp individual. So we were able to work with, uh, with him. So anyway, they sent me to the airport. They sent one of the uh, postal clerks to uh, uh, Murray Field because the Marines were coming in the helicopters from the aircraft carrier USS Bennington off the coast. And uh, they, they did send me down to Fort Tuna. The, the National Guard was coming in there, the Army, with helicopters. And so they wanted me to come, come in and check uh, with them to see how they were doing. And everything was, was fine. The superintendent down there was handling everything very well. So my next move at the airport was to try and find airplanes that I could get mail on. And we weren't allowed to... I had no contracting authority to go to a private aircraft of any kind and uh, strike up a deal, so it had to be strictly military. So one of the first, so one of the first ones that landed happened to be a, a Coast Guard uh, four-engine patrol, uh, patrol plane loaded with electronics, but I tracked the pilot down and asked if he could take any mail out and where was he going to, uh, to fly to. So he said he was returning to... Uh, I believe it was um, the Coast Guard base in San Francisco at SFO. So he said, well, we'll take what we can. Well, they were so loaded with, with equipment that uh, it came to pass that he only was able to take maybe 30 or 40 sacks of mail. And we had mail stacked up everywhere because at that time, going back a bit, the... Um, um, let me think here a minute. That's okay. So the wonders of modern equipment is the it's all well, no, the, now. the <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the postal service handled ninety nine percent of all parcels then, not UPS because that was before UPS was so active. So consequently, we had mail everywhere, and our PMT drivers, uh, the Pacific Motor Transport was the contractor that we used, a branch of Southern Pacific, to bring the mail in on truck. Well, the head driver for Eureka and uh, his crew, plus quite a number of the trucks were stuck behind, so they were put at our disposal at the, to take the mail up to the airport. And So we stored them in trailers, stored sacks of parcel post and trailers until we could finally jar them loose. Um, 
I'm not one to really think quick, so yeah, I have to give no, you a no, chance. No, no, you're doing fine. And I was thinking, like, what worst time could it be? Because it was Christmas time, so you had... Well, that's it. We were just absolutely flooded with mail. And the only mail that we were getting out on somewhat of a regular basis was the airlines that flew in here at that time. I believe it was Hughes Air West and maybe Pacific. Uh, they had a contract with us to take first class mail and a certain amount, but of course they were passenger aircraft. So we sent out what we could with them. Um, we got the mail on the Coast Guard plane. They were a very, a very nice crew on there. And, and um, so they took off and, and uh, mind you, I'm in the middle of the airport and the planes are starting to come in from every direction. I have no telephone because then we didn't have portable telephones to speak of. So the only access I had to a phone was one that was at the base of the tower in the ready room. So whenever they needed me during this period of time, they had to send a runner out on the runway to find me or else I would check in. And then um, I would have to be almost in constant touch with my, my boss here in Eureka. So it uh, made it very difficult trying to run back and forth all the time, trying to keep things moving. So the next airplane that came in was a U.S. Navy C-54 Freightliner, a freighter, and that was the day before Christmas. These are the ones I can specifically remember. There were others, but I can't remember them offhand. And it was Christmas Eve, and I asked him where he was headed for. Well, he was going back to uh, Alameda Naval Air Station. So I said, could you take a load of mail? Well, he was a cargo plane, not a passenger, so I said, fine. Well, by that time, the truck driver that assisted me from Pacific Motor Transport and myself were the only two available. And so that meant unloading a truck into the, uh, and of course the Navy had their crew aboard the aircraft. So we had to pass mail from one to the other. And uh, we had, it was practically pitch dark up there. We had a little light in the uh, overhead of the truck that we worked under. And I noticed this, another figure join us. Well, it happened to be our resident postal inspector, which we had at that time. Um, a real fine fellow. And he, the reason it was hard to see is he always wore black wherever he went. He, he was a very good dresser, and he, he dressed in a black suit, a black fedora, and carried a black briefcase. And he's climbing on this truck, and I thought I never thought of him doing anything like that because he was a post office cop is what he was. So anyway, he uh, came on board and the next thing I knew he was throwing mail with us. So I don't know what time we finally got out of there. It must have been midnight, I suppose. So then we were able to take off for Christmas and uh, I, uh, on Christmas day, I, I might have worked part of the day, I don't remember, but uh, Christmas night, um, we were set up for dinner and, and here in the house, and I was here at the time. And I went to sleep at the dinner table, so my wife got me away from the table and, and uh, laid down on the, on the couch, and that's the last I remember until the next morning, and I was tired. So by that time, they had started to, to get a little bit of organization up at the airport. They had a... a uh, Lieutenant Commander, I believe he was, lieutenant, or a uh, Navy Lieutenant Commander who they put in charge. I don't know that he was probably reserve, but uh, he was very good at what he, d what he did. He was a good organizer. So that meant that uh, we were able to get a few aircraft <clears throat> assigned to me and uh, so he got one, I don't know where it came from, but it was Army. It was what they called a little otter, and uh, they still use those up in Canada a lot for bush flying. And it had a pilot and a co-pilot and a crew chief. It only carried nine people. <clears throat> and the crew chief was the top sergeant, and the pilot and the co-pilot were both captains. So anyway, they were supposedly at my disposal, and they were assigned to fly mail from here to Crescent City. 
Well, the most they could get on one of those little air, those little otters was about 30 sacks of parcel post because you bulked out before you weighed out. The mail was about 35, 40 pounds per sack. So they could only take 30. They still had the passenger seats in the aircraft. So they flew back and forth between here and Crescent City under terrible weather conditions. In fact, I wondered if they were going to make it a few times because we, they were very late getting back while they were fighting the weather. And they said that's the worst they had ever flown in. And uh, one day during this time, the commander, lieutenant commander, uh, contacted me and asked if we could leave the mail off the plane for one, one flight up because they had a, uh, an army man who was on emergency leave with his wife and child and they had no way to get to Crescent City. So they put him aboard the Otter and took them up. But um, when you think of at least three sets of double vans, each 20 foot long, full of parcel post, and only 30 sacks per plane load going up. It was like dipping, you know, dipping a soup bowl with a thimble. But um, anyway, uh, then they started to run some C-119s. They were um, what they call flying boxcars. And they were out of Sacramento under the Air National Guard <clears throat> and uh, they were the man in charge was a full colonel. We always kind of chuckled because uh, he was a, what they call a bird colonel, and his name was Don Chicken. But uh, anyway, Don was a really nice guy, and and I kept leaning on him, trying to get him to make a detour and take one of his aircraft up to Crescent City with a load of mail. And I almost convinced him, but he said no. He had his orders, and he had to stick with them, which he did. So with the C-119 set up, they were flying in from, from Sacramento with uh, emergency supply, supplies of all types and then mail when they could handle it. And of course, going back, they had plenty of room. So I was able to get rid of all the, the uh, parcel post that was going any distance at all. And uh, so I had two main problems, to get parcel post to Crescent City and to get parcel post to Garberville because I had a couple of truckloads for Garberville backed up too. And uh, the first class mail, a lot of it had been sent out through Murray Field with the Marine helicopters. They were able to take it out. And getting back to this postal inspector that I spoke of before, his name was Dave Good, he uh, as I say, he was a, a post office uh, policeman, and his primary duty is, is the safety and sanctity of the mails and the safety of the personnel and the particular post office. So he had the terrible task of checking on all 35 offices that uh, were in the area to check on how much mail they had lost and how to protect what they had and if the building was still intact and if there were any injuries, which there were not to any of our postal people. So he rode a lot of the, uh, the uh, Marine helicopters out of Murray Field. He did help me that night at Christmas Eve, but generally speaking, he was uh, trying to get into the hinterlands if he possibly could. He told me a little later of one of his uh, flights on a Coast Guard helicopter they flew, he was headed for Willow Creek or that area, and uh, I think they made it up there okay. And he took his reports and made sure everything was okay, and they were flying back, and the weather moved in, and their visibility was bad, so they, uh, they followed Highway uh, 299. And it closed down on them, somewhere around Berry Summit, so they had to land on the highway, and they sought refuge in a ranch house for a couple of hours until it lifted so they could come on in. But he had some hair-raising flights, to say the least. And the mail clerk that was out at Murray Field, I think he took a couple of rides too. He didn't say too much about it, but they liked to have somebody, a representative of the post office on board, if they could. 
So the C-119s were doing a fine job, as I said, out of Sacramento. And um, I was still trying to hitchhike mail on any military aircraft that came in. Now, I have read since then, I can't tell you exactly where I read it, but the um, uh, McKinleyville Airport was the busiest airport in the United States for a couple of days. The busiest airport in the continental United States in those days was O'Hare in Sacramento, in uh, Chicago, excuse me. And uh, we were doing more air traffic than O'Hare for a couple of days. But it was just amazing to see the aircraft going in and out of there. So I guess it got close to New Year's. They flew in some CV-2 Caribous. They were a twin-engine de Havilland a plane that had reversible props. They could back up to a, a barn or a building and load from the rear. And they had just come back, a lot of them, from fighting in Vietnam, where they dropped supplies to the troops. And uh, they were what they call stole aircraft, short takeoff or landing. So they could uh, take off in just a, a few hundred feet and land the same way. They carried about 8,000 pounds. They had a crew of three. Uh, there were, I don't know whether there were, f I think about a half a dozen altogether. So as soon as I got wind they were setting up, I saw them come in. Well, I went over to their commander and tried to lean on him. Well, he said, well, the first thing we have to do is get uh, hay delivered and dropped to the cattle. And once we get the cattle fed, then we'll, we'll help you out with the mail. So they called me over one day and uh, lo and behold, they were ready to take one aircraft to Garberville. So I had the crew load up the aircraft and uh, they said, we would like you to go with us. So the, they had a spot, each of the aircraft had a spotter, including the helicopters that were local aviation people. In fact, Dave Zebo, who was the aviation director, was the spotter on this particular plane. Well, the co-pilot was a full captain and the pilot was a warrant officer. And uh, the crew chief was, was a uh, top sergeant. So we loaded up and uh, we took off and had to, had to fly the 101 down to the Eel River because visibility was so bad. So we stayed treetop level to Garberville, all the way to Garberville, and landed. And as soon as we landed, the ceiling closed in and there was no way we were going to get out at the time. So they had communicated with Garberville to tell them that we were en route with mail, so we had the necessary vehicles there to unload. So we all went uptown to Garberville and had a cup of coffee. Well, we didn't want to lean on them for food because they were in dire straits down there then for rations for everyone. So we sat and had our coffee and the pilot kept watching the, the sky and he said, I see a blue spot, let's get back to the plane. So we hustled back to the, the plane. On, I don't know if you've been to Garberville Airport, but it's not too big and it's uh, surrounded by mountains. So we uh, went, we drove back to the plane and everybody took their positions in the aircraft and we sat and waited. And when the blue sky got a little bit more blue, then it was time they found a, a hole, well, they took off. And I mean, it was just a few feet, we were airborne. And the crew chief had told me, he said, when we go up, he said, make sure your seat belt's tightened because he's gonna hang it on his props. And he did, he took it straight up and up to uh, about 8,000 feet. When we got up to 8,000, we started to ice up then. So we were empty at the time, so we had no cargo to worry about. But uh, they leveled off at 8,000 and then dropped. Uh, they flew due west to the coast. By the time they got out to the um, shoreline, they were low enough where we had no more ice. So then they dropped down to oh, probably about 500 feet or so above the surf, and we came home following the beaches to uh, McKinleyville. So it was, it was an adventure. Then uh, 
a day or two later, they called me and they, they had uh, two of the aircraft available then to fly mail to, uh, fly parcel post to uh, Crescent City. So Crescent City was notified and we've got two of these planes coming in, they haul 8,000 pounds apiece. So we took off, flew up the, the coast, and of course by that time they had set fire to a lot of the debris on the beaches. And you could just see one, one, one line of smoke, pall of smoke up the beaches to, Gar to uh, Crescent City. Well, we, dro we dropped into Crescent City with no problems. The only problem was when I, I looked as we came down the runway, I see one little moving van out there for two plane loads of mail. And they took one look from their vantage point and saw the situation. So they quick went out and got themselves a couple of semis. And so we got unloaded and, and hustled on back. From, from then on, then they started to move mail for us and things simmered down somewhat. But uh, it, was, uh, it was an adventure in itself. I'm just imagining this kind of sense of um, <coughs> drowning the mail. Because <coughs> it's like people don't realize, mm -hmm. you know, that <coughs> mail moves because you have a place for it to go. And when it doesn't go, mm -hmm. it starts backing up. And what a sense that has to be for somebody who's in charge of moving it, mm -hmm. because people don't quit bringing in new mail, <laughs> or from the from the local area. Anyway. Yeah, you're still getting packages. You're still getting stuff that you have to deliver. Well, that's true. <coughs> the <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> the uh, volumes of mail didn't really stop, and people kept mailing with the hope it would get out. You know, they didn't stop to think of what we might have to go through. It wasn't a matter of everybody stopped mailing for a while because we can't get out. They just keep on mailing. So we had, uh, I don't know how much mail we moved altogether, but I had a crew of about three with me. We would leave every morning from the main office and uh, stay up there until dark, until everything started to simmer down and then we'd come home. And we had a lot of help. There were many volunteers that fellows that were out of jobs because of the flood and wanted to uh, help out as much as they could. And there was a couple of them a little perturbed when they found out that my, my people were being fully paid. But uh, I mean, that's just the way it was. And uh, at that time, we didn't get overtime. We were, pay we were given comp time, compensatory. So. I ended up after everything was said and done taking a month off because uh, I, f I don't know how many hours I had racked up, but quite a number. Um, it was um, a very cooperative bunch. The, the pilots were all very cooperative. There were a couple of, of uh, pilots that wanted to lease or, or maybe let us use their aircraft, but I had no no uh, contracting power whatsoever, so I was had to refuse them. Well, one other um, situation. Oh, sure. There's a wire that's hanging down for your yeah, mic. Yeah, I was noticing that too Sorry, a little while ago. Just for a second. Am I looking down too much? No, uh, actually, yeah, a little bit. Yeah, I I have a hard time thinking. And Ted, um, the thing came unclipped in the front. Okay. You know, everybody has like their place where they look at when they're trying to recall events, so yeah. it's, it's perfectly normal. Mm -hmm. yeah. I don't want to screw goes, things up. Yeah. Yeah. No, actually it doesn't need to hang out at all. You don't oh. need to see it at all. Oh. You could tuck it back there so that it doesn't show. And then just try and run the cable underneath the collar around to the back. Fred, would you say testing, please? That back far enough? Just say oh. testing. I'm not sure. Texting. Testing. Texting. I think that's good. Try again. Yeah, I think that's good. Try again. Testing. testing. And then sorry. You testing or texting? Testing. Testing. <laughs> testing. Okay. Yeah, I'm just going to check levels because he just moved that mic around. Ah, okay. Now. I think that's good. All right. Thank you. One thing I'd uh, failed to mention was. Um, in order, in the early part of the of the problem up there at the airport, 
the post office department in San Francisco, we were po the post office department then, now today it's the postal service. But anyway, they made this decision they would send us some mail via commercial aircraft. So they took two of the commercial airlines, I believe it was Hughes Air West. They didn't bother to take the seats out of the aircraft. They were twin engine aircraft, probably seated not more than 40 people, I would say, at the outside. But um, they loaded what they could, the parcel post, on the aircraft. And I got this call, they were coming, so when we opened the doors of the aircraft and looked in, here's all these sacks of parcel post stacked on the seats and also on the floor. They left the aisle open, but <clears throat> When they did that, they had to lash it down. So rather than, than lash each seat mail, they took a long, endless cotton rope and started from the front and went clear to the back, in and out, making all kinds of knots and so forth. And of course, I looked at that and it was gonna take us forever to unload this aircraft, and we had two of them. So I wanted to get out my pocket knife and start cutting ropes, but then I started to think they wanted us to send mail back and I had to use those same ropes to, to uh, retie everything that went out of here. So I called San Francisco and said, don't do that again. No, we don't want any more of that because it's a waste of, of manpower and time. Um, then they started sending in some of their big four engine cargo planes. I don't remember the type of aircraft except they were large four engine army aircraft and they can carry a lot of mail. And then they started to bring in the, of course we, we have to remember we not only had the parcel post, but we had third class, that would be your magazines, be your periodicals and so forth, which are treated as another class, that's third class. So they held that back because what was important was the first class mail, the letters, and then the parcel post, which would be Christmas gifts. We'll worry about the publications later. So as soon as they got these, these large cargo aircraft available, they started to load those up and they were heavy because you, a sack full of magazines weighs a lot. So we had that to contend with and that was a real job getting all of that off up there too. But uh, that was probably towards the last before they started to, to do that. But it was quite a while before they got things opened up again. I can't tell you much about surface movement because I was up there and that was my thing to do. Yeah. So. Yeah, that was a while before things got back to normal. Mm -hmm. yeah. Correct. Wow. And would you um, just say a sentence again? Because I think I, what I when I mentioned it being Christmas time and that being a bad time of the year, I think you responded to me, but um, didn't like make a complete sentence out of it. So I so I would just ask you again. Um, hmm. So that must have been a bad time of year because you had all those Christmas packages to deal with. So It was a bad time of the year weather-wise with, with packages and Christmas mail because at that time the post office was the prime mover of, of parcels, not UPS as it is today. Perfect. Is that better? <laughs> well done. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you guys have any questions for Fred? Anything that you'd like I don't to have ask? Any. Nothing? Okay. I think that's good, and man, you Let me take a look at that. Yeah, why don't you do minute. that, because that will help John's memory. <clears throat> yeah, that pretty well covers it, I think. Yeah, you did a good job. Made yourself notes and didn't even need them. Wish I could do that. <laughs> <That's great. laughs> well, I'm supposed that's to good. speak on that. I got to speak on this in December. Oh, okay. <coughs> Are they, is the Historical Society going to do a 50th anniversary? Uh, I don't know. It, you think? I don't know. I'm going to be speaking oh, to the, the Pioneer Asian? Society on, yeah. this, on this one. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. And we gave, um, I suppose you talked to Jerry Scott. He's next week. Oh, next yeah. It's Friday. Yeah, he couldn't no. do today, but I tried to get him today, too. Mm -hmm. Roll up your pant legs. Be ready. <laughs> he's a so nice I've guy. heard from several people. <laughs> oh, he's... he's He's an attorney. What do you expect? Yeah, I know. He right. does it for a living. <laughs> You're not putting this on, of course. But. No. <laughs> no, he's, uh, he's, he's a good guy. 
But he and I, and uh, did you get hold of that one, I, Jim uh, Hill? I haven't called him yet, but I was trying to figure out where we would group him with, but I think we're going to mm -hmm. be doing some more interviews next Friday and Saturday in Eureka, so I'm mm -hmm. thinking that I will contact him yeah. soon for that and see if that Yeah, the three of us gave a presentation two years in a row down at the county library for the Historical Society. This has been a number of years ago now. Yeah. But uh, Jim had a very interesting experience, of course you'll find out later, but he he was a spotter on a helicopter, and uh, he made one flight, and it's, he's lucky that he ever got to McKinleyville. But I think I saw that, and yeah. I saw because I watched that videotape that they made for the library, and uh -huh. um, <clears throat> yeah, it it sounded like you know <laughs> it should be about here, you know, sort of thing, and then out of the fog, the tower yeah. appears. Yeah, 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 that's that's what happened. And, and sort of the cliff too. But, yeah, yeah, the cliff. Yeah, because they'd been following the ocean like, and they had to <laughs> had to climb to go land. Yeah. Yeah, it was almost like he was a mat and um, uh, a rat in a maze in his mind and took them exactly where they needed to be. And mm -hmm. any deviation from that trip he took them on would have been disastrous. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. definitely so. That's a crazy no, thing. he he really used his head. He's he's a nice guy to talk to. He's he's quiet, he's soft-spoken, uh -huh. but a nice guy. Good. So I don't think you've run into too many people that weren't pretty decent. Oh yeah, everybody mm. so far has been wonderful. Yeah, that's good. Wonderful interviews we've done um, all over mm. the county, all the way up to, we were up at Rathwa last week, um, and we're going to be going inland to mm -hmm. um, Hoopa and Orleans. And Have you been to Orleans yet? Um, I've been there before, yeah. but it's... Have you ever seen of, the airstrip there? No. <laughs> well, one of our guys, um, he was with me, one of my crew up there, one day they decided to send him with, a, they took a CV-2, one of those caribous, and uh, loaded up mail for the area and supplies, and they wanted him to ride with them. And he said, boy, that was a hair-raising experience, because from what I understand, I, I don't remember the airport too well myself, but the runway's not level, it runs uphill, and it's very short. And he said that was a real thrill going in and out of there. He would have been fun to talk to too, but he's deceased now. So anyway, yeah. there's a few of us left.